good, uh, good evening. My name is Daniela Caruso. I am the director of the Center for the Study of Europe within the Paris School of Global Studies at Boston University. I also teach at the law school here. Um, today we have a wonderful guest, Professor Anu Bradford. Um, uh, Anu Bradford is the Henry Moses Professor of Law and International Organizations at Columbia Law School. At Columbia, she also directs the European Legal Studies Center. A leading scholar on the EU's regulatory power and a sought after commentator of the European Union and Brexit, Professor Bradford coined the term Brussels effect 10 years ago to describe the European Union's enormous influence on global markets. Tonight, Professor Bradford will present her book, The Brussels Effect, How the European Union Rules the World, published in 2020 by Oxford University Press. We scheduled this presentation months ago and we were absolutely certain that by now we'd be in a post-COVID-19 situation and we were looking forward to meeting in person, but here we are. Thank you for joining us virtually. Professor Bradford is also an expert in international trade law and antitrust law. She spearheads the Comparative Competition Law Project, which has built a comprehensive data set of antitrust laws and enforcement across time and jurisdictions. The project, a joint effort between the law schools of Columbia University and the University of Chicago, covers more than a century of regulation in over 100 countries and has been the basis for Bradford's recent empirical research on the antitrust regimes used to regulate markets. As discussants today, uh, we have two esteemed colleagues at Boston University. Um, Tarek Hassan is Associate Professor of Economics at BU, although this year he is visiting Associate Professor of Economics at Harvard. Professor Hassan's research focuses on international finance, microfinance, and social factors in economic growth. Some of his recent papers study the effects of uncertainty on firm behavior and on the allocation of capital across countries. Another set of papers studies the effect of social structures on economic growth and the effect of historical migration and ethnic diversity on foreign direct investment. Kevin Gallagher is a professor of global development policy at Boston University's Frederick Pardee School of Global Studies, where he directs the Global Development Policy Center. He is the author or co-author of six books, including the 2014 Ruling Capital, Emerging Markets, and the Re-Regulation of Cross-Border Finance. Gallagher serves on the United Nations Committee for Development Policy and co-chairs the T20 Task Force on International Financial Architecture of the G20. His specializations include economic development, trade and investment policy, international environmental policy, and Latin America. I would uh, love to start with uh, Professor Bradford's presentation of her book. Thank you so much, Daniela, and thank you all uh, for joining. So maybe I get started uh, with a few words of why I wrote the book. So the book is my response to this very persistent narrative that the European Union's best days are over, that it is inevitably a declining and increasingly irrelevant world power that has very little influence of the state of the uh, affairs in the world. Because this narrative of the EU's weakness very much contradicts the kind of EU that I witness in my teaching and my research every day. So let's think about a few examples of how I perceive the EU to be powerful. And if we start from digital economy and some of the the most prominent American companies, if you think about, for instance, Facebook or Google or Apple or Microsoft, these companies have one global privacy policy and that mirrors the GDPR, the European General Data Protection Regulation. And if we then think about again Facebook or we think about Twitter or YouTube, they don't follow the American Constitution's First Amendment when they decide what kind of speech they take down from their platforms. Instead, they have signed a voluntary code of conduct which uh, obliges them to mirror the European definition of what constitutes hate speech. And this is not just a story of digital economy and not just an effect that we are feeling uh, in, uh, in America. You can see examples of the companies around the world conforming their production and conduct to the European Union standards globally. If we think about, for instance, uh, 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 Indonesia, how timber is harvested in Indonesia is determined by EU law. 
the EU law also determines how honey is produced uh, in uh, Brazil or um, what kind of uh, facilities Chinese dairy factories install, what kind of chemicals Japanese toy manufacturers uh, use. Um, so there are many examples uh, across the world. If we think about Africa, agriculture, what kind of pesticides Cameroonian farmers use? Again, that is determined by EU law. The question though is why would these companies in different parts of the world and across different industries would choose to follow European law as their global benchmark, not just with respect to their products that they export to the EU, but even those that stay in their home markets or that are exported to third uh, markets. This is the phenomenon that I call the Brussels effect. And by the Brussels effect, I refer to the European Union's unilateral ability to regulate the global marketplace. And the logic is as follows. So the EU is one of the largest and wealthiest consumer markets in the world. And there are very few global companies that can afford not to trade in the EU. So in order to access the lucrative European market, these companies need to abide by the European regulations. But what makes it interesting is that often these companies conclude that it's in their interest to follow these EU rules across their global production or global conduct because they want to avoid the cost of complying with multiple different regulatory regimes. So all the EU needs to do is to regulate the single market. It is then the market forces and the self-interest of the global companies that transmit these EU rules across the global marketplace. There's no need for the EU to elicit cooperation and there is no from foreign governments and there is no need for the EU to coerce, to impose its rules on, uh, on anybody. It regulates the single market, sit back, sits back and the markets do the rest. So the obvious question is why would we see the Brussels effect and not for instance, the Washington effect or the Beijing effect. The EU certainly is not the only large consumer market in the world. But what I argue in the book that it is not enough to be a large domestic market. It certainly is a starting point. You cannot be a unilateral global regulator if you are Costa Rica and you decide that you want to have the most stringent environmental regulations in the world. The global companies, if they find your regulations too burdensome, they would just decide not to trade in Costa Rica, but they cannot abandon the European market. But let's go back to why the Brussels effect, why not Washington effect or the Beijing effect. The market power is important, but you also need to have the regulatory capacity, the legal institutions that allow you to unleash the power of that large market and convert it into tangible regulatory influence. So this is a distinction to China, for instance. Beijing today does not have the same kind of regulatory architecture that there is in Brussels. It is building it, but that takes uh, some time. In Washington, on the other hand, there is plenty of regulatory capacity. What is missing though, is the political will to deploy that capacity. That capacity since early 1990s has largely sat idle when the US has decided to pursue a strong deregulatory agenda, step away from global regulation. The EU has then stepped in and filled that void. So you need to have a large domestic market. You need to have uh, a regulatory uh, institutions that architecture, you do need to have the political will to pursue stringent regulation. I also explain how the EU cannot always externalize its regulations through the market forces. The EU can only do this when we are dealing with what I call inelastic targets. So for instance, it's very hard for the EU to be a unilateral global regulator of capital. Capital is mobile, it is elastic, it can move if the EU regulates at too high of a level. But the EU mainly regulates consumer markets, the environment, those cannot be moved to circumvent the EU's jurisdiction. Then the final component of this theory, which I actually think does the most analytical work in the book, 
is this uh, consideration of what I call non-divisibility. The EU is only able to exercise its unilateral power. The Brussels effect only takes place when we talk about non-divisible targets, meaning when it is in the company's interest to forego the opportunity of taking advantage of less stringent standards elsewhere and opt for uniform standards. So when they do not want to customize and tailor different products for different markets, but when the reasons such as scale economies push them towards a uniform standard, that is when they normally choose to follow the most stringent standard because that gives them access to all the markets around the world. So that is basically the, the logic of how the Brussels effect operates and how the regulatory power is being harnessed through the market forces and externalized uh, across the global marketplace. So with this conversation, I not only invite a conversation of what is the EU's role in the world, I also invite the conversation of what kind of power matters today. Because when we talk about regulatory power, this differs from our traditional notion of power. It is not hard power like military power, and it's not exactly soft power, the power of persuasion or the normative power that the EU is often associated with. Rather, the regulatory power captured by the Brussels effect falls somewhere in between. It is something that is not coercion, as I mentioned, it is not cooperation, but it is something different. And I would uh, uh, argue that it is the kind of power that matters. Hard power, for instance, is very costly to deploy and it can be undermined by others. International cooperation can be very fragile, as we saw when President Trump walked away from many international institutions. He could not walk away from the Brussels effect. That is something that if Facebook, for instance, decides to follow European rules across the world, there's nothing the United States government can do to prevent it from doing so. So in many ways, it is particularly pertinent power in that it reaches all of us every day. It affects the food we eat, the air we breathe, and the products we produce and consume. And to me, that is power, and that is influence, and that is relevance. So let me now uh, say a few words on whether this is something we should be celebrating or whether we should be concerned about the Brussels effect. So first of all, it is a descriptive theory. I am interested in explaining a phenomena that I think is real and significant and that matters whether we like it or not. But obviously there is a normative conversation that I invite in one of the chapters as well as to whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Does it improve the state of the world or, or not? And there I engage with three specific criticisms that have been uh, leveraged against uh, the Brussels effect. So one is this idea that regulation is costly and it deters innovation. And obviously, if the Brussels effect multiplies these regulations, we are also multiplying the costs and we are curtailing innovation, not just in Europe, but across the world. And I think it was an interesting uh, conversation I had with one of the US tech executives when I asked about the difference in dealing with American and European regulators. And he said, look, what Europeans want us to do is to satisfy a consumer need. What Americans want us to do is change the world or allow the world to be changed. And if every tech company innovated towards satisfying a consumer need as opposed to changing the world, some of the most disruptive innovations probably never would take place. So I think it is a criticism that we need to take seriously. But at the same time, I think it would be too quick to conclude that regulation always deters innovation. We have many examples, for instance, in the environmental space where energy efficient technologies have improved environmental outcomes, but also led to great innovations and efficiencies in the marketplace. There's also a wonderful book by a French economist, Thomas Philippon at NYU, who has written this book called The Great Reversal, How America Gave Up on Free Markets. And he shows how the lack of antitrust regulation in the United States has led to increasingly concentrated markets, 
to increase profits for the companies and higher uh, prices for the consumers. Something that we have not seen in the EU where the markets are actually more competitive, partly because the EU has committed to deploying its antitrust laws to tackle the problem. So I think the question is more nuanced as to whether the criticism that regulation would always be costly really has the merit. So let me now turn to a second criticism that you often hear when we talk about European regulation. And especially when you uh, see the news how the EU once again leveled very high fines against Google in the antitrust domain, how the EU is pursuing Amazon uh, through antitrust laws, and then the same thing with respect to Apple. So it seems to be that the EU is targeting big American companies, which has then contributed to this narrative that this regulation stems from industrial policy, protection, protectionist motives, whereby the EU is trying to give a leg up to its less efficient companies that cannot otherwise compete with their more innovative American counterparts. So I would obviously take any accusations of protectionism seriously, because I do not believe that is a path towards European competitiveness and efficiency. But I think it is questionable whether protectionism is really driving the European regulation. If we look at these antitrust cases, there is no European search engine that the EU is trying to protect. Who are the complainants on this other side of the other side of these cases? And who are the main beneficiaries if the EU goes against these companies? The company that initially brought the complaint to the commission against Google was Microsoft. If we think about the massive billion dollar fine against Intel, who was on the other side? It was another American company, AMD. So often this is American companies fighting their civil war on the European territory because they turn to Brussels in the absence of Washington being willing to protect the global marketplace and its competitiveness. So in many ways, these are not US versus EU battles. They are often US versus US battles in that sense. So I am less persuaded by the criticism of protectionism, but let me now address the third criticism that we often hear. And that is this accusation that the European Union is actually engaged in regulatory imperialism. That is imposing its standards across the world, compromising the democratic prerogatives of foreign sovereigns and the political autonomy of the citizens around the world that in fact, we are producing products in America to cater the European consumer's preferences, which may not be shared uh, by American consumers. We also have African farmers refraining from using GMOs, even though they would probably need those GMOs for to feed their growing populations. So here, the argument about regulatory imperialism, the main response that the European Union has is that look, all we are doing is regulating the single market, which we have the sovereign right, even sovereign obligation to do. And we are not telling what you should be doing in your own countries. It is then the decision of private companies to follow the European rules because of their market incentives. So in that sense, it is hard to say that the European Union is being imperialist. There's also another argument, and I realize this can be controversial, but uh, it is interesting how many would concede that maybe the regulatory status quo in the United States does not reflect the truly democratic preferences in the United States because of the role of money in the regulatory process, because of the role of lobbying by powerful corporations, in particular after decisions like Citizens United. So maybe the Brussels effect is only offsetting some of the democratic deficiencies in the regulatory status quo in the United States. The same way that there are many consumers in other markets, let's say in developing countries that are grateful that the European Union is keeping their they bodies and their environments safer from harmful chemicals because their governments do not have the capabilities and the resources to pursue these regulations. All these consumers also benefit if the European Union tackles global cartels that raise prices across the global marketplace. So again, I think it is somewhat questionable 
which way the regulatory imperialism argument cuts and whether some would actually be rather describing the EU as a global benevolent hegemon. I would also say that any unilateralism from the EU's part is contingent at best. The EU is willing to work on climate change through the Paris Accord. But if we do not effectively manage to handle these issues through international regulation, the EU is not going to sit back and let the climate change uh, uh, basically not be mitigated. So in many ways, it is the second best argument that when the world collectively is not able to reach decisions on these issues, then the EU will go it alone. So in my final, um, uh, final minutes, I'm gonna say a few words maybe about the future of the Brussels effect, and then I'm eager to turn into our commentators and the conversation. So one obvious question is whether the Brussels effect will last. And here in the book, I engage with both external and internal uh, uh, challenges that may erode the EU's global regulatory influence in the years to come. And if we talk about external threats, the rise of China is obviously an, a, a question that we all would ask. And whether the Beijing effect will be replacing the Brussels effect sometime soon. And there I am not for a moment disputing the inevitable fact that the relative size of the EU's GDP globally will go down. The relative importance of the EU's market will be less significant. And China, for instance, will be more significant. So over time, yes, there may be more companies that can conclude that the EU no longer is an inevitable trading destination. But the reason why I don't think we see the Beijing effect replace the Brussels effect anytime soon is that the GDP per capita is a much better predictor of the country's ability and willingness to regulate than the GDP alone. And they will be a long while before the Chinese consumers are so wealthy that there would be a need to actually regulate at the level of sustainability, for instance, or data privacy as there is in the EU today. And by the time the Chinese consumers are that wealthy, the overall GDP growth in China will likely have slowed down to the level that the Chinese government might be reluctant to impose regulations that it considers may further dampen the growth there. So few thoughts on, or th those were a few thoughts I wanted to uh, share on China and we can talk about more on that uh, in the Q&A. In terms of internal challenges, there are a few that I discuss in the book, one being the, the, the growth of the anti-EU sentiment in the EU. But if you, for instance, look at the, the governments like Hungary and Poland that are very sovereignist, very nativist, their main concern is not the single market. Their main concern is to control the journalists, the civil society, to make sure that they can control the immigration and the judiciary and press. They are not as worried of the EU deploying its antitrust laws in a very rigorous way. But let me maybe uh, end with the two, uh, uh, the very topical issues, one being Brexit and then maybe a few words on COVID-19, which obviously was not uh, part of the script when I was working on the book. Brexit was. And the argument that I make about the Brexit in the book is that Brexit does not undermine the Brussels effect nearly as much as the Brussels effect undermines Brexit. Of course, with Brexit, the EU is losing a substantial chunk of its market, and that would uh, uh, erode potentially the Brussels effect. It is also losing important regulatory capacity. But what it is gaining is that in many ways, the UK was the voice that was most skeptical of regulation. Now there is much more political space to regulate. And very importantly, if you think about the UK's claims that with Brexit, it is somehow declaring regulatory sovereignty, unleashing itself from the shackles of the EU regulations. That is very difficult to realize because of the Brussels effect. About 45% of the UK exports are destined to the EU. This will be the reality even after Brexit. These companies need access to the EU market and these UK companies need to abide by EU regulations in order to trade in the EU. So if you are a UK automobile manufacturer, do you want to produce your cars to the standards set by the EU, which is a six times more important market than your domestic market? 
or do you want to follow the UK standards? You do need to follow the EU standards. And your question is, do you really want to set up a second production line in order to produce to a different standard in order to serve your domestic market? This is why the British industry was adamant that they want regulatory alignment uh, with the EU. So the regulatory sovereignty argument was one of the biggest false promises of the Brexit campaign, and it will be largely mitigated because of the market forces that are driving the British companies in the future also towards the EU rules. One thing might change though, and that is that the UK companies may well be living in an ever more regulated Europe uh, uh, for the years to come. Because as I mentioned, they are no longer shaping those rules. They have chosen to be a rule taker as opposed to rule maker. And that pro markets skeptical voice on regulation is no longer there shaping the regulations. Much more space for Franco-German industrial policy and pro-regulatory uh, 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 attitudes to prevail. So final word on COVID. So obviously COVID wasn't known when I wrote and I now often get a question, will this change uh, the Brussels effect? And if COVID had really brought globalization to a halt, it would also bring Brussels effect to the halt. The Brussels effect depends on global markets. But what hasn't happened is the really reversal of globalization. The global companies haven't started to, uh, uh, to produce and source and sell locally. They still need global markets. They may be hedging and, and diversifying their supply chains, but they are not repatriating them to the extent that they wouldn't be operating globally. There are a couple of other reasons that may also insulate uh, Brussels effect pretty well from a crisis like COVID. So first of all, the, it is a manifestation of technocratic power, which has its own timeline and its own dynamics. The commission officials, we, are, we continue to draft regulations. They sit by their desk and write, whether it's the Digital uh, the, uh, Services Act, Digital Markets Act, whether it's the Green Deal, because that's what they are tasked to do. They are not tasked with the massive political and economic upheaval related to COVID. The technocratic power, for instance, shows how the GDPR was revealed, even though it was the height of the refugee crisis, even though it was after the Brexit vote. The technocrats continue to draft regulations, no matter what is happening at the heart of the political battles in the European Union. And second, the EU tends to grow through crisis. It seems to gain as opposed to lose powers. So what we may see after COVID-19 is stronger rather than weaker Europe. So I don't think that we are done with writing regulations in the EU. We've already seen last month the unveiling of the significant set of uh, uh, regulations in the uh, uh, digital domain. And we are seeing, for instance, a lot of more regulation uh, in the area of environment and climate uh, coming our way. So I think this is a, an effect that is real, that has been significant today, and that is not going away anytime soon. So with that, let me just uh, pass it over and uh, thank you so much for your, for your time up until now. Thank you so much, Anu. This was great. I, I knew that uh, Tarek was aware of your work when we had a panel on Brexit a while ago. And one of the reasons why it was so hard to make sense of Brexit was indeed the Brussels effect and the presence of this uh, great gravitational mass next, just right across the channel. Um, Tarek, your thoughts on the Brussels effect? Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Anu. This is, uh, this is great. Um... So I, I guess I have a, a number of, of thoughts about this. So the first is like, you know, I guess my students all think regulation is super boring and kind of nobody wants to do research on it. Uh, you kind of think that until you kind of look. So I, much of my work is about uh, looking at firm disclosures and what do firms say about their business. And uh, uh, whenever they talk about politics, 99% of what they talk about is not healthcare reform or tax reform or whatever, it's regulation that is very specifically and very granularly affecting them and nobody else. So what's kind of really stunning, uh, and I think a, a massively under-researched factor in economic development, uh, that the, 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 the surface area of the interaction between government and firms is incredibly rich there's a lot of contact that any given, even small firm will have with the government 
And almost all of it is about very specific regulations that affect you know, a few firms at a time. Now, what makes that tricky um, is that a, a dynamic like that uh, um, opens regulation up for capture. Meaning if you have very specific regulation and this regulation is necessary, right? So there's in the US maybe three producers of heart valves, all small companies and they better be regulated, right? They're gonna put the heart valves into people's bodies. So we need to make sure that they actually work. Um, uh, and regulators make decisions that put these companies either in business or out of business. And it's dramatically important decisions. Um, and they're boring and hard to measure and there's very little data on it. So, um, so in terms of research, I think this is a big open field. Um, uh, what this debate sort of uh, reminds me of a lot is, a, is an old debate in economics about rules versus discretion and monetary policy. And the reason I say this is that like most of the world actually is not Europe and the US, but it's like lots of other countries. And what these countries have in common is often poor institutions. So if you look at Egypt, there's a fascinating study uh, in the World Bank Economic Review looking at how do Egyptian, uh, how's the, how does the Egyptian government decide what regulations to put in place, they call them non-tariff barriers, uh, because essentially those are all reasons why, you know, an imported whatever you're producing car or um, imported tire can or cannot be sold in, uh, in Egypt. And, uh, and what, they sh like what they show in the paper is that essentially what gets regulated is determined almost 100% by who has connections to the regime. So essentially what happens is uh, the, 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 the national regulator does, and, I, and, I, and I'm not really sure what, like how it works, whether they carbon copy foreign regulations and then deviate only as political favors, or whether they just don't have regulations in the first place and make them up to make imports hard to protect cronies, essentially. So, so I think this is kind of an incredibly important question. Um, and it, it, it can re relates directly to sort of political capture on the one hand and also to state capacity. There's this fascinating question. Up until the financial crisis of 2008, you know, I was walking around everywhere and asking, and I thought like a great research question is how is it that a country like Iceland seems to have, you know, seems to be with, you know, Iceland has a, a smaller population than the number of people drafting regulation in other countries, right? So how can it be that consumers are safe in Iceland? Well, it turns out maybe not. I'm not sure, but these things are poorly understood. And uh, I'm sort of delighted by this book because uh, it's, it's, you know, I was gonna ask you about the data set and uh, where, is all, where is all this text that we can look at and, and try and study like, essentially who copies regulations from whom. I think that's just in, in principle, a very interesting question, regardless of whether it's the EU winning or somebody else winning. Um, on Brexit, I fully agree. I think the, the obvious outcome of Brexit is going to be that the UK will have to copy almost all regulations that come from Europe. And in the case of the UK, it's very clear because they're so close and there's no hope of them. And there's gonna be a few symbolic things where they deviate, but essentially, uh, uh, you know, this is going to end up looking very much like Switzerland, where regulations are essentially aligned. Um, there is a, a tug of war, I think, between uh, always between local companies that have political connections and are not intent of competing internationally, trying to close off their local markets by having weird regulations that are hard for to deal with uh, uh, for imports. I think that's a fundamental force, you know, pulling against globalization. On the other hand, there are big global corporations that essentially, they don't really care exactly what the regulation is and as, as long as they know what it is and it's the same everywhere. And I think in some sense, what we're seeing play out is like a, a political tug of war between these two forces. Um, so, uh, okay. Yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, thanks, Tarek. Um, Anu, would you like to say something now, maybe briefly responding and before we move on to, to Kevin, whom I think is going to take it in a different direction? Yeah, Tarek, this was fantastic. So let me just offer very few uh, um, brief responses or remarks. 
So um, I, I want to maybe start from where you ended this idea that we have this tug of war between uh, local and global companies. And I, th I think that is something that I address a little bit in my book and where the really uh, significant work was done by David Fogel in his work on the California effect. And he really talks about this political dynamic, how the uh, large globally operating companies that already need to follow these rules become then advocates of, uh, as, uh, of the regulation in their home market as well. So what we do see is that Facebook, Apple, Google, they have told that they want to have a US federal privacy law that would be modeled according to the GDPR because they already comply with the European rules. And it is the local small companies that actually have then a advantage in their local markets if some of their counterparts are held to a higher standard. So this gives the incentive for these global companies to then pursue, for instance, in the context of my research, I show how they become the advocates of EU regulation in their home markets. So that's one, I make a distinction in the book between the de facto Brussels effect, whereby the EU rules are being followed across the global marketplace, even if the foreign governments did not change their regulation. But we often see the de facto Brussels effect pave way for de jure Brussels effect, whereby the foreign governments start copying also the EU regulations. So we also see these replicas across the world. And I've done some work, for instance, showing how the EU competition law, the antitrust law has been much more influential than American antitrust law that has become a template for many governments around the world. So one reason is the de facto Brussels effect because the companies have lobbied for the most stringent standard but then there are other reasons. So for instance, the EU regulations are detailed, more specific than the US law. So it gives, for instance, as you mentioned, Tarek, the countries with low capacity, the state capacity, it gives them a much more detailed blueprint. They don't need to navigate through the complex case law of the United States when they have very carefully drafted regulations. And what more? You are a Francophone country, you get those templates in French. You are in Latin America, pull them out in Spanish and pull them out in Portuguese. All the expertise is also available in your own language. So there are certain practical reasons why the EU law also appeals to these, uh, these um, uh, different countries. And another reason is that the EU regulations are already drafted as a compromise designed to work in 27 different nations, which makes them often more flexible for different types of countries that have different legal institutions compared to the US law that is tailored to work in a more uniform uh, system as such. So those were a few issues. I do want to mention also lobbying and the capture because I think it is interesting that if you take my uh, argument, you believe that it is right and you take it seriously, as a global company, you should go all out and lobby Brussels because then you get the outcome that you want globally. At the same time, there's less research on how lobbying works in Brussels because the transparency registers that give us the quantitative data of how much lobbying actually takes place, it hasn't been as uh, rigid in terms of the reporting as the data in the US and it doesn't go long, uh, back as long in the, in the history. But the, the, the newest research on lobbying shows how the corporations do have some influence, but how that influence in the EU is strongly counterbalanced by the, the, the civil society and NGOs that also have significant access to the legislative process. So the corporations are not driving the outcomes the same way they are in the United States. Many helpful comments, but let me just leave it at that and with just a deep gratitude for, for great insights, Derek. Um, so, um... I thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this. I am uh, happy that uh, uh, Kevin is also here with us because uh, Kevin focuses on development. And one thing that struck me both in the book and in the presentation is that somehow the Brussels effect is considered as a global phenomenon. And uh, maybe it's another story, but there is an, an aspect of differentiation between the Brussels effect vis-a-vis -vis, uh, developing countries and the Brussels effect vis-a-vis -vis the transatlantic trade. Uh, so I, I welcome Kevin's presence here for the granularity that this work uh, brings to these questions. Please, please, Kevin. Thanks. Hey, well, first of all, look, welcome to BU and welcome to the Center for European Studies. We're so sorry that you uh, can't be here with us and 
in Kenmore Square uh, uh, in the snow. Uh, it's, it's been snowing here uh, in Boston all day. Um, but thanks so much for coming. And hopefully you'll take a rain check and come visit us here uh, in Boston uh, when we when we can all do this. Um, I had a I had I, I loved reading your book. Um, I actually have enough gray hair that uh, I read the Vogel book when it came out, and um, it was core to some of the early research that I did. And and correct me if I'm wrong. I know Professor Celine is is uh, is in the audience here. I think he actually brought Vogel here a couple of years when he wrote a, a sort of spinoff of that book just about Europe. Um, so really like that book, and really like. Uh, uh, your hypothesis that uh, goodbye California, hello Europe is sort of the Twitter handle story of what your what your book is is um, is saying, and I, I couldn't agree more that uh, on many levels the European Europe in general and now the European Union uh, for a long time has has probably been the hotbed of innovation on social, environmental, and consumer protection policies uh, uh, around the world. I'm 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 less convinced that that it's uh, a widespread uh, pulling the rest of the world uh, along with it. I think that you've shown some some cases where it's tugging some of the world, but I, I wonder how widespread it is. I think the, the theoretical drop uh, backdrop of the work uh, comes from the economist uh, Albert Hirschman, who wrote a, his first classic book was called uh, Market Structure and the Theory of Foreign Trade that said, hey, countries with large, large market power um, even if the rules and negotiations are basically uh, the same at the same table, the country which are larger market power is able to exhibit more of its preference and in, and in, and in, and in, in literally change the structure of foreign trade. And that's 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 sort of the core of what Vogel was was uh, was evoking as a political scientist. And and I've I've seen work that he did, and and you uh, and you you follow up on food toxics, et cetera. There's lots of examples of, uh, of where, we can, where we can see this happen. Um, one of the uh, terms in the Vogel book that I missed in yours uh, that I, I always love to talk about uh, is, you know, how do these regulations uh, get in place? And he came up with this, uh, this term of the Baptist and the bootlegger coalition. And I think that that's a key part of the political economy of regulation within the European Union is that uh, unfortunately other countries in the West and especially in the South, um, usually we have what are called winner take all markets. You have the firms that are gonna benefit the most from certain policies, whether it be trade policy or environmental regulation, really lobbying for it. Uh, and those that are gonna be against it, lobbying against it. Um, and in, especially when it's cross border, some, you know, the net losses uh, for firms might be small on one side, the benefits to consumers might outweigh those losses, but they're dissipated. And so you get these weird political economies. Europe invests a lot in creating winners and compensating losers through its public investment banks. The case of the KFW is, is the case in point. Uh, uh, Germany had very deep vested interests in the coal sector and the nuclear sector and highly pollution intensive activity. It's really Pollution intensive activity, carbon intensive activities would build the built the German industrial mir miracle. Uh, but the country then realized that it wanted to move away from pollution and wanted to go be, be carbon free. Um, and they had basically the entire manufacturing sector against it. The KFW, which is the one of the largest banks, private or public, in the world, um, decided to create winners. They devised a big industrial policy to be able to create new clean energy sectors, energy efficiency through through that. And they also had adjustment mechanisms and, and Germany used fiscal policy for that as well for folks who are gonna lose their job in the coal sector, lose their job in some of this pollution intensive sector to go there. So the what's interesting about the European Union is that it's not just, uh, there's definitely a Baptist coalition to use the words that, uh, that uh, Vogel said of, of folks who are environmentalists, folks who, who uh, who have a certain standard of living where they can really care. They want to eat good food. They want to eat healthy food. They want to treat animals right. They want to go carbon free. Um, but there's also bootleggers who are firms who are going to benefit from those kind of policies now. And those who aren't going to, there's opportunities for them to move into it. And I think that's an important part uh, of, the, of the story. And obviously the European Investment Bank, which doesn't get much in uh, discussion in the, in the book, 
uh, is really now the, the European Union wide manifestation of that. They've just, you know, they're a monstrous bank. They've turned themselves into a climate bank. Um, not only banning investment in coal, oil, gas, and now they say they're going to move into roads for cars they're not going to finance anymore, but moving the, uh, making adjustments and making simultaneous investments in those other sectors so that they can, so that they can win there. Another key European uh, innovation is in the central banking realm. Uh, Europe, the European Central Bank and, and the other central banks in Europe have really moved into climate change in monetary policy, uh, doing stress tests to see what the exposure of the financial system is to coal plants, uh, increased incidence of extreme weather events and so forth, and trebling monetary and financial regulations to reduce that exposure uh, for, the, for the people. That's, that is the cutting edge of, uh, of a lot of what's going on in financial markets. And, and now there's private products and green bonds and ESG bonds that have really come out of Europe. In that space though, there is some diffusion of it, but I'd say that's more a diffusion of ideas than, than market power. The market isn't there for those kinds of products yet, which is why Goldman Sachs and folks like that are, are, are too behind. But Europe's making a bet. You know, I think one of the things that Europe does is in its innovation, it makes some real first mover bets and sometimes it's really won. On the, on, the, on the diffusion of the world, especially in the developing world, again, I, all of your cases, I would never dispute you on your cases, but I could come up with five quick ones that, um, that, that don't exactly match the same, the, same, uh, the same story. I would agree, the title of Vogel's book was Trading Up, right, if I remember correctly, that definitely firms and countries trade up as a ticket to get in to the e European Union. But I'm afraid it doesn't have enough market power to also completely green their supply chain and their national policy making, and therefore it might trade up, but it doesn't always trickle down. Uh, one case is China. Clearly, China is not building any coal plants in the European Union. No way. However, uh, we have a database at the Global Development Policy Center that uh, looks at Chinese overseas development finance. They're financing lots of coal plants in Malawi, in Indonesia. In, uh, in Vietnam, all over South Africa, uh, et cetera. So in that case, definitely gonna go for different investments. They've made incredible investments in the ports in, in Greece, uh, but they're not doing coal plants because you don't allow it, but it's not stopping them from doing it, uh, doing it in general. Uh, another example is on deforestation in Brazil. There's actually a woman who, who unfortunately uh, was here an economist at the Earth and Environment Department who moved out to Europe to, to Zurich. Her name was Rachel Garrett. Her name is Rachel Garrett. <laughs> um, she was at Boston University. And she did an interesting econometric analysis. So yes, Brazilian firms have a segment of their product line that meets European standards. However, their, their larger market was in China and doesn't have those same standards. I think it was on chemicals and in, in, in the soybean sector. Um, soybean demand for China is, you know, orders of magnitude more than more than the European case, and uh, they they segmented that for there. Now that's just another case. It's just one study in another case, but it's just an example. I'm not so sure how how super widespread this is. Another one that a lot of us are really concerned about uh, is an EU trade policy. So the EU Mercosur trade deal, uh, but the European Union has just signed a trade deal with the Mercosur countries, Brazil, Venezuela, Argentina, Uruguay. And those countries have a comparative advantage in soybeans and beef. And uh, there's a lot of uh, beef uh, per capita beef consumption um, and, uh, in, in the European Union. And soybeans and beef are the largest drivers of deforestation in the Amazon basin. Um, and deforestation in the Amazon, well, de deforestation in tropical forests is the third largest carbon dioxide emitter in the world, third behind China, the United States, and then tropical deforestation. Tropical deforestation is basically the Amazon basin, Indonesia, and parts of the Congo. Uh, the US, uh, excuse me, the EU uh, Mercosur deal has nothing about climate change in it. It's actually, it's a shock to the, you know, the, the climate change community is uh, up in arms and and it might be the biggest threat to the deal passing uh, in the European Parliament. Um, it has some nice little language that, the, that all countries should be party to the Paris Agreement, but that'll do nothing uh, to impact the comparative advantage that Brazil has. 
um, and the incredible amount of deregulation that's going on by the Bolsonaro government in Brazil right now, letting go of all regulations on, on the Amazon because he, he doesn't believe that climate change is even a problem and he thinks that, uh, that it's just a bunch of scientists uh, trying to stop Brazil from its development. Um, uh, of, of the last one I say is on, on the financial regulations. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Europe is not necessarily an innovation hotbed on financial regulation. Um, definitely have borrowed a lot of the mistakes from, from our country and then went further. Um, when the United States and, and Europe were negotiating the TTIP, uh, which was a trade deal between the two, the two entities that uh, the Trump administration threw out with just about everything else, if you remember uh, when the Obama administration was putting together the Dodd-Frank bill, uh, they were so concerned about the, the lack of regulation on the European side that they wanted to take out the financial services chapter of the, of the entire agreement um, that was supported even by you know, Simon Johnson, folks at the International Monetary Fund were writing and saying this, you know, we, we, can't, um, we can't harmonize our standards with, with these folks. So those are, those are five examples where it might not be widespread but I'm not going to knock the, the your big thesis that the, the European Union isn't innovative, isn't on the cutting edge, isn't uh, is is is, uh, is irrelevant. Um, that those are irrelevant arguments to me. Uh, this place is a, a hotbed of innovation. It has market power. It doesn't have the market power that it had in the 80s and 90s when the Europe Europe and the United States were about 70 75 percent of the world economy. It could exert that influence now, and it was where all the dynamism was. Uh, now, you know, in the late 20, 20th century, Europe and the United States are about four, a little over 40% of the world economy and uh, you know, about 30% of the increase in growth. So they just don't have that teeth to pull. But I think they're, uh, I think they're tugging uh, at the rest of the world. And even better, I would say they're, they're really leading by example. Uh, so keep it up. We've tried to change some things here in the US in the past couple of months, but we got a lot of catching up to do. Thanks so much. Excellent, Kevin. That was a terrific set of comments. And uh, I will not be able to do justice to all, all those insights in a short time. But let me just mention uh, a couple. I love that you brought up the, the, the Baptists and bootleggers. And I have a few examples in the book that are probably a little bit thinner, but uh, examples like in the GMOs. One of the reasons that the EU has been able to move forward is that we had a coalition where consumers partnered with traditional farmers and the supermarkets, for instance, the big chains that were uh, um, on one side of it and the big uh, agri uh, like Monsanto's on the other side. But the, the particular coalition building that I emphasize a lot in the book, because to me, that is the central story that has an equal and uh, um, sort of a, an insight as how you bring different coalitions together. And I spent a lot of time explaining why one of the reasons that the EU has been able to pursue such stringent regulation is that there's always a twin goal. One is that whether it's uh, data privacy, enhancing the fundamental rights uh, of individuals to their the data, or then whether it's an environmental uh, goal or the health concern relating to chemicals. But the second goal is also market integration. You are integrating the European market through regulation, through regulatory harmonization, which is why you get the political right that loves more frictionless trade and the political left that likes, for instance, the political, the, the, the goals of protecting the environment. This is how you get the companies that do like, as you said, they don't care what is the regulation as long as it's the uniform regulation. So the companies like the single market creation that comes through regulation and can form a political coalition with many consumer groups that are at the forefront of trying to drive, for instance, the, the, the uh, environmental change. So in that sense, that's probably the, the particular aspect that I emphasize a lot, but I think your story, and for instance, I am not uh, give, doing justice to uh, the, the very good points that you make about the public investment banks facilitating in this kind of coalition creation and, and, and creating more winners. I think what I, it's really well taken when you mentioned, for instance, how we continue to see coal plants being built in different parts of the world. The EU cannot influence the regulation in the rest of the world when there's no EU market access involved. The EU can only step in that the Brussels effect takes place when there is some kind of a connection whereby the EU can 
impose the threat of closing access to its market. I think what may be interesting, and I do spend some time in the book saying how the Brussels effect is needs to be complemented by different regulatory tools like trade agreements, where the EU is trying to then also impose some kind of a regulatory change where it cannot rely on market access alone. For instance, human rights provisions, rule of law in third countries, but those are very difficult to enforce. The, the logic of the market forces don't necessarily do the job for the EU. This becomes a political battle and it's harder. But how the EU is, for instance, now trying in this, during this commission to tackle the issue of coal plants being built across the world is that the EU is trying to impose a carbon border adjustment, a tax whereby it would be then tied to the market access. We look at how the products are being produced and we would then calculate the carbon emitted in that process. And if the EU is successful there, and interestingly, it is also floated by the Biden administration that the US might be joining forces there, it could have a real impact and it could address some of these issues as well. Um, I completely agree with your assessment that the, in, the, uh, in the European Parliament, the Mercosur agreement is gonna have a tough ride. So is the investment agreement with China because it's too lenient on some of these provisions that are very fundamental for the European value system. So we'll see how that will go. Uh, on financial regulation, I think what you lay out is exactly what I would predict in, in my theory when I say that the reason the EU has been weak in financial regulation is that two of the five preconditions for Brussels effect are missing. One is that the EU does not have as extensive regulatory capacity compared to what it has in some of the core areas of single market. Um, and the second is that capital is elastic and the EU has not had the full ability to tap into the Brussels effect when it comes to regulating finance. Um, but terrific comments and, and Kevin, thank you so much uh, for sharing them with us today. So I, well, I have to read a couple of questions from, uh, from, from the crowd, which is, which is great and I'm going to do it momentarily. Um, I want to uh, give uh, um, at 5.30 the possibility of wrapping up this session with our esteemed uh, guests if they have more important, um, uh, more, not more important, but more urgent things to do. Uh, and we can move to informal session. I wanted to, however, start with a couple of questions from the crowd and then maybe move to informal sessions. Thank you so much for the, for, for the comments. I have a few more, but I don't want to hold up people. So I have a question that has to do with the difference between the decision of the general court and the attitude of the European Commission in the Apple Ireland case. The question is, uh, do you see a possible weakening of the Brussels effect and any further violations by big tech in the presence of internal divisions between the Commission and the judiciary of the European Union? Um, we can start with this one. Yeah, so I think it is a very, very, it's a great question. And we often see a dialogue between the Commission and the court. And in many ways, the idea that the EU the commission decision are reviewable by the court, I think lends important legitimacy to the decision making in both directions. So for instance, if the commission was now to follow the more of a Franco-German instincts to pursue more industrial policy driven uh, merger control policy, I am not sure the court would be happy with that necessarily. So in many ways, the court is an important check. And in the Apple case, that the final word yet hasn't been said. Uh, this is something for those who haven't followed the EU, the commission imposed a very significant penalty, uh, claiming that Ireland had given a uh, tax benefit to Apple that Apple took advantage of, and that Apple would need to pay that back to Ireland. So 13 billion was at stake. The court overruled this. Court basically said that the commission was wrong with this decision. This is a path breaking, uh, breaking area where the EU does not have regulatory capacity when it comes to taxation, but it has the capacity to pursue competition law and state aid is part of the competition law. But this was in this very interesting area where the EU tried to make a very aggressive move, uh, which the commission said is, is completely consistent with the powers it has had since 1957 on competition law. But it was always going to be uh, potentially uh, a fragile to a challenge uh, before the courts. But I find that in many ways, um, a very healthy part of the system. We have many areas where the court has expanded, not curtailed the regulatory power of the commission. Many of the rules have been very integrationist, but at the same time, by setting some boundaries to the regulatory power of the commission, 
it creates important credibility and legitimacy to the system. And in many ways, I think it, it reinforces the, the appeal of the EU regulation because it adds to the quality of the regulations, which I think is absolutely key and ultimately in the long term makes the EU regulation stronger. Um, so uh, because the question was uh, addressed to, uh, so the, the last question uh, depend, uh, related to internal European developments. I, I have a question about that, uh, Anu. How is the book received when you present it uh, outside of the Brussels core of the European Union and you address more crowds in the periphery of the European Union. I mean, the, 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 the argument, one of the arguments that was levied, uh, leveled against the European Union was that the regulatory move was a move by the wealthier member states uh, upon the others. So, and, 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 and the question is, what, what, what kind of pushback do you get by those who have suffered the increase of regulation? Uh, there is a convergence of values uh, that, of course, is reflected at the uh, upper echelons of the institutions. But uh, as we know, there are some who are cut off from this kind of uh, virtuous circle that elevates the regulatory standards throughout the European Union. Um, how's your How's your work received? Uh, do you think that the European Union, insofar as it demands more out of states who would not have engaged in that degree of regulation, uh, do you think the European Union has engaged in sufficient redistributive policies to make up for that um, through any other mechanism? Uh, please. Yeah, so absolutely. I think what is interesting here is that often when you have internationally a conflict among the countries, we tend to settle with the lowest common denominator. We are harmonizing down as opposed to up. And that hasn't been the case in the EU because the commission has normally, these regulations are rarely developed in the hallways of Brussels. They come from member states and they normally come like Daniela was suggesting from Northern member states that can afford to regulate. So for instance, if you think about privacy, the privacy rules were very strong in Germany. They were strong in France, strong in Sweden. A lot of the environmental rules come from the Nordic countries, the Netherlands, Germany. And then instead of then asking these countries to tone down their regulatory instincts, the commission jumps in and said, let's remove the discrepancy. Let's all regulate at the level of Germany and Sweden when it comes to environmental law. So that's why I think Daniela's question is important. Why do the others put up with this? So first of all, we don't need everybody to agree. That may not be a satisfactory answer. It would be nicer that every 27 of the 27 member states would be for these regulations. But when it comes to uh, uh, the single market regulation, we normally work with qualified majority voting. So many of these regulations may not have been supported by every single member state. However, I wouldn't say that every time these member states that were opposed were left with nothing. They have been very important other redistributive elements. And in many ways, there was also this consensus that we need to not just pursue an economic Europe, but also social Europe and social Europe broadly understood. Regulations that contribute to social goals, but also there's been important redistribution through regional cohesion, other funds that have sometimes been part of the linkages that have been discussed together with the regulations. So I think on balance, there has still been uh, not just a situation where these would be regulations where the North imposes them necessarily only on the South. So I did not get that much pushback. I think there's been probably enough other policies that are the center of the resentment, whether it's in terms of Euro crisis, where the, the stakes have been very big, where there was a perception of very much of unfairness Right now, I must say that also the conversations this year when we managed to set up the recovery fund, there certainly was a strong element of benefiting the countries um, that, that, that suffered uh, the most as well. So many countries like Italy and Spain were benefiting the most. Um, so um, I think this is a very important conversation, but it hasn't been as much centered on the questions like privacy even though underneath, I completely agree that sometimes these regulations were not invented as much in the southern member states or the member states that could not have necessarily afforded to comply quite as much. Thanks. Um, another question from, from, from the audience. Um, 
uh, can you describe, uh, can you talk about uh, anti-EU sentiments uh, flowing from the fact that the European uh, Union has blocked uh, certain mergers such as uh, Francis Chantier de l'Atlantique uh, and Italy's Fincantieri or Alstom and Siemens. Um, we go into antitrust territory now. Uh, can, you, can you tell us whether this contributes to anti-EU sentiment and if there's been any pushback from countries that are trying to leverage these kinds of uh, local coalitions? Yeah, so first of all, the, the question of mergers, the conversation was whether, for instance, we would be seeing um, the EU either uh, try to support European champions or whether it should support European champions, that it would, for instance, be very stringent when an American company or Chinese company tries to acquire a European target, but then let big European companies merge so that we could build a more sort of industrial power and help the global competitiveness of the European industry. Traditionally, that has not been the case. And I actually authored uh, an empirical study where we looked at over 5,000 mergers since 1990 until 2014. We had a complete data set of all the mergers uh, notified to the commission. And we looked at whether the challenge rate was responding to the nationality, meaning whether the EU was more likely to challenge a foreign acquirer acquiring a European target. We saw none of that. But that has led to exactly what is behind this very insightful question is that some said, well, maybe it should have, maybe the competition policy should not be neutral. And it was really culminated when the EU uh, ab uh, abandoned, it basically prohibited the, the proposed merger between a rail merger between uh, Siemens and Alstom. And this would have been an opportunity to create a European champion. And France and Germany were very upset. But the Commission of Festager defended not being political and deciding this merger on merits and rejecting it. And even though it was told to her that, look, what about all these big Chinese companies and Europeans can't compete against them? I, I love the quote by Festager saying, look, let the Chinese be Chinese. They are, we would be lousy Chinese. They are much better at it. So in many ways, her job is to watch for the interest of European consumers. Germany and France did not give up. They published this manifesto calling for a political review mechanism whereby these commission decisions could be overturned by council. This to me is a dangerous development. The, the, the non-industrial policy driven competition policy has served Europe really well. And let me now tie to the topic of today, the Brussels effect, and, and, and mention that if the EU was to try to convert its competition policy into a tool for industrial policy. Not only, in my view, it would, it would hurt the competitiveness of European firms. It would also have likely the spillover effect whereby we would be exporting through the Brussels effect protectionism as well. What would prevent the Brazilian competition authorities then to start uh, uh, favoring Brazilian uh, mergers and for instance, blocking European companies attempts to acquire Brazilian targets? What would prevent then this protectionist sentiment from being exported down within the EU, whereby soon the French competition authority says, I am going to block this attempt to acquire a French company by a German company. It would also fragment the single market. So it would be very hard to contain any of the effort to try to convert uh, the competition policy into a tool for industrial policy. So that's something that I feel rather strongly about, but it is really a debate that is emerging. And the UK is now not, not part of that debate, which also gives more voice for France and Germany to push this. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs>